Right. Um, welcome to this section on maglutalit. Uh, real pleasure to be uh, doing this along with my colleagues. Yves so this talk is just a bit of overview on a novel technology uh, called EMTT, which is, stands for Electromagnetic Transaction Therapy, and giving a bit of a flavor of the possibilities and also the indications, uh, the mechanisms and also most importantly looking into the evidence. Since we are all clinicians here, it will be really important to look into some case studies, case, dis uh, case discussion, and uh, Ovi will be sh showing the practical demonstration. So I've been uh, working with Ven Healthcare for a few years. Um, I lead the shockwave service, uh, really excited on uh, uh, getting involved in this novel treatment. So I don't think I need to remind anyone of the reality with the COVID crisis all around. So um, there's a lot of apprehension among our patients and a lot of patients are staying away from, moving away from hands-on treatment, obviously because of the infection risk. So there's really a key need for something which is effective, safe, and also non-invasive. So I think this ties in perfectly with EMTT, which, which I'll be going through in detail in a second. So I think the sort of the whole uh, idea of uh, you know hands-off treatment and also being effective sort of plays really well with the new technology. So let's start fr right from the basics. So I like to keep things quite simple. So what is EMTT? Obviously the trademark of EMTT is the magnetolith, but EMTT in a very simplistic uh, word is basically high energy magnetic pulses. So you got um, the magnetic pulses created by the coil of the machine, as you can see from the applicator there. And uh, it's uh, entirely non-invasive treatment. Um, and even this advantage, you don't need to undress and uh, you don't have to have a direct contact. And the main indication is mainly therapeutic pain relief. So we'll, we'll explore that um, you know, uh, in that in detail. So that's pretty much it. So instead of sound waves, which we use in shockwave, here we're using therapeutic magnetic pulse at a very high energy level. So when we talk about magnetic waves, it's something not uh, new, but specifically when you talk about EMTT, the key thing which is different here is there is no thermal effect. So you're not getting any heating effects and it's totally pain-free. So there's hardly any pain during the whole treatment. And the main indication is mainly for pain relief. And as I mentioned before, it's uh, uh, really attractive now because of um, uh, you know the infection control issue. And in fact, you can leave the patient safely during the treatment, which is around 10 to 15 minutes, which we'll go through. Might be useful to just spend a couple of minutes on magnetic fields and how is it relevant for therapeutic effect. So let's start with something very obvious. The earth is a big magnet. And as you can see, uh, we got the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, no, uh, you, your screen's not been shared at the moment. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh dear. Okay, let me go back again, sorry. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry, let me start again. Okay, so, sorry guys, so, uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, I've been talking about the indications, mechanism of action, um, technical factors. So, a bit of reality on the COVID situation, which I mentioned. So, EMTT, as I mentioned, is pretty, mu pretty much just like we're using sound waves for um, uh, the shock wave. Here, we are using um, magnetic waves. And the main therapeutic effect is for a pain relief. And some of the key advantages, which I'll be going through detail very shortly, is um, it's you know, totally pain-free. There is no thermal effects, no heating effects. And the patient can be left unsupervised during the whole treatment as well. So talking just one or two slides on magnetic fields. So the earth is a huge magnet. We are surrounded by magnetic fields all around. So from our television, from our speakers, uh, uh, most electrical devices will have a magnet. So it's something which a human body is used to. I think it might be useful to look from, um, specifically from a medical point of view. So I think as clinicians, we all know about MRI scans. So MRI scans has been used very safely with humans, can be used even for kids, even for pregnant women is needed. So it's been used since 1970s without any major issues with, uh, on human tissues. So when we talk about, just like when, you, when we talk about bar in shockwave, 
the unit of uh, the intensity or the magnetic influx flux density or the induction is something called Tesla. So Tesla is basically the unit of uh, flux density or the intensity of a uh, magnet. And when you have a normal MRI scan, so suppose you've got a shoulder pain, back pain, the normal scans you're going to do with an MRI, either in the NHS or private, will be 1.5 Tesla. So that's pretty much your standard MRI scans. It's getting more complex now. So more and more places are offering three Teslas. So with my hip patients, I usually send them for three Teslas. You're going to get better pictures. So, so normally, you know, it depends on your practice is between 1.5 to three Tesla. So I would say 90% of NHS uh, will be 1.5 Tesla. And one Tesla is uh, roughly uh, you know, 1000 milli Tesla. And with a single dose of EMTT magnetol, you're getting less than 10% of what you would get with a normal MRI dosage. So you're not really giving anything huge here. So if you're having 10 treatments, that equals to one MRI. So it's very safe and the dosage is uh, very low when we compare from uh, uh, MRI. Now, one of the things which will stand out when people Google EMTT and Magnolic is pulsed electromagnetic field. It's called PEMF, which has been around for a good 40, 50 years. So this has been something which has been well published um, and is used for healing fractures. It's quite large. It's a long duration of treatment. It's quite cumbersome. They need a lot of sessions. So some key, some key differences here, key differences when we talk about PEMF and EMTT is the big difference is the, the energy output. So the energy you're getting from an EMTT is around 60 to 80 Teslas, whereas you, you're talking okay. with PEMF is only 40. So it's a big difference by 30% more, and it's much higher in oscillation. So it's really, um, you know, much more powerful. Might be useful to show that in, um, in a visual form in the next slides. Although there's been a lot of pub uh, publication on PEMF, there's hardly not even one RCT. So it's, the methodology is very poor. And um, so it's, there's not much of evidence base to support PEMF. So when we look into the, so this is quite useful to look at the image. So the depth of what you get in EMTT goes up to 18 centimeters. And it's a wide area. So it's really attractive when you have a patient with um, widespread pain. I'll go through the indication shortly. So this is pretty much what the waveform looks like. And it, because of the handpiece, this is pretty much the shape you get. And you also have the depth and also the width. So, so you're getting sort of... Um, that sort of wide space here, you know, about 18 centimeters and about 14 centimeters across. So really useful for somebody who comes with a diffuse pain. So normally when we're giving shockwave treatment, we try to give that to, to patients who have pain in a specific spot where they say like it hurts here at a specific area. But when you have a patient, when they say the whole shoulder hurts like a frozen shoulder or a hip OEA patient, they don't have a specific point. And that's where I think MTT stands out is when you have a diffuse, a widespread pain, that's where I think it's, it's quite useful here for us to uh, use this modality here. So technically it's very different from PEMF. It's more powerful, more oscillation, widespread, and also um, you know the uh, energy flux intensity is much higher. So that's something key to know. So I think with every patient or a clinician, the first question they're going to ask when they use any device is, uh, how does it work? You know, obviously the physics bit is nice, but we're, we're dealing with humans and we are not just uh, machines. You know, we are biological, uh, you know, uh, entities. And what I think a therapist would be interested in is what does it do on the human body and the human tissue? Uh, because it's different when you do on a lab with a fridge or with a magnet, but uh, humans are complex and multi-layered. So let's look into some biological effects of, um, EMTT um, uh, specifically on uh, human tissues, both in the lab and clinical studies. The first thing which this evidence is quite clear is, so this study, the reason I picked up, there's been at least 40 to 50 trials. The reason I picked up this study was, this was not conducted in the lab. This was done you know, on human, like knee patients with knee OA. And then they gave them EMTT. What they found out was there was a strong anti-inflammatory effect of EMTT on human synovial tissue, which is the key thing which uh, surrounds the joint and the chondrocytes and osteoblasts. And when you have a process like osteoarthritis or um, uh, a stage one frozen shoulder, you get a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is linked with 
with high pain levels. So when we give EMTT, there is a significant reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokinin. So what we can say with confidence is based on clinical and human data is uh, giving a cause of EMTT has a very strong anti-inflammatory effect. So this is where it's a bit different from your normal shockwave, which generally has a pro-inflammatory, which we use in chronic cases. So uh, whereas this seems to settle it down nicely. So um, the, that is pretty much the main key factor here is the strong anti-inflammatory effect of EMTT, especially on the synovial tissue, which surrounds the joint. So this could explain why it's very successful in acute flare-up of any osteoarthritis or hip OA or a spinal pain as well. So this is sort of a key effect. Now you could ask, why is this important? You know, why is the inflammation around the joint important? Now about 10, 15 years ago, we used to have a very simplistic view of, of knee osteoarthritis. This is what I used to say to patients 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you get old, you get wear and tear, your cartilage wears out. That's pretty much osteoarthritis. Now we know that that's not really the case. The cartilage is the last thing which gets involved. The first area where your body gets involved with osteoarthritis is the synovium. Initially, you get inflammation around the joint. So you get a bit of synovitis around the joint. And then the bone, the subchondral bone, get a lot of edema. You get swelling within the bone. And that's where the pain is. So the majority of the pain, so you might have a patient with osteoarthritis with severe arthritis on the x-ray. Obviously, we can't change the cartilage yet. You know, obviously, in the future, we might have stem cells and things like that. But what we know is the most of the pain coming from osteoarthritis and most degenerative cases is not the cartilage. Cartilage doesn't have any sensation. You can't feel pain in a cartilage. So the pain comes from the synovium, which is the capsule around it, and also the bone underneath, what we call the subchondral bone. Um, and um, that's where I think if we can reduce inflammation, so you could have a patient with a very bad x-ray, bone to bone or even in a cartilage, but that might not be the area where the pain is coming from. The pain is coming from around the joint itself. And that's how EMTT is very helpful is to reducing the inflammation around the joint to reduce that pro-inflammatory cytokinins, which can you know, do that. So I wouldn't really say to a patient that I'm making your cartilage better. The cartilage can't be improved. Uh, that's the holy grail in orthopedics. Um, but we can definitely reduce the inflammation and the sort of uh, pro-inflammatory chemicals around that. And just to show you a little bit more. So when, you, when we do an MRI scan of patient with osteoarthritis with pain, and when they get a flare up, so you've got a normal healthy cartilage, um, and then you have the synovium, which is not here. Then when the synovium gets inflamed, the bone here, the subchondral bone, just below the cartilage, that gets inflamed. So on the MRI, you can see bone marrow edema, which is basically swelling of the bone. And any swelling of the bone, especially in symptomatic patients, is extremely painful. So when we reduce inflammation, what we are doing is we are doing nothing to the cartilage, but we are reducing the inflammation in the synovium. And we reduce that. When we do serial MRIs, we can see there is a reduction of bone marrow edema as well. So bone remodeling is driven by synovitis. So I think historically, we used to think we need to target the cartilage. I think in the next 10 years, we'll be looking at um, drugs and new treatment to target the bone underneath, the subchondral bone and the synovitis. And that's where we're already having very good results with uh, EMTT already. Now, you don't have to um, you know, uh, trust me on this, but this is a very reputed journal from Nature. So uh, this is an open access. So this, the second key mechanism of how EMTT works uh, is sort of nice. It's one of the most difficult articles I've read. Uh, a lot of physics, a lot of biology. Uh, you know, so, you know, it's not something I would uh, suggest to have an easy reading, but it's quite thorough. So if you really want to know how magnetic field affect on a cellular level, this is the best paper, uh, which you can read um, on that. So what it says is, when you sort of give a strong electrical current to, to the cell, pretty much what it does is it opens up the lock. So let me, let me be very clear. What it does is on a, on a cellular level, it improves cell permeability. So cell permeability is one of the key functions. Uh, it reduces as you get older, it reduces as you get diseases. So basically a functioning of, uh, of a cell depends on good change of uh, your chemicals across each cell through the membrane. And when you give EMTT, what it does is it improves the cell permeability. Uh, the body is able to reactivate your sodium and potassium pump. It accelerates cellular activity. 
it improves tissue uh, healing. So that's the key mechanism. It's very, very different from shockwave because the shockwave doesn't really do anything on the cell permeability. It has, it creates an inflammatory response, which is a different cascade. Whereas the, the effect is very different here. Here, what, what the EMTT does is opens up the cell, you know, you know, cell gates, helps the body to do what it does naturally. So when you have a disease process, when you have synovitis, when you get aging, when you get a degenerative process, the cell permeability is lost or reduced, and that is really restarted. So, and again, there's another good article here. What are the factors which affects cell permeability? Uh, depends on age, depends on pain, depends on osteoarthritis, depends on temperature. So it's not an old wives tale when patients tell you with knee osteoarthritis that they get pain when they, when they, when they get drained or during winter because the cell permeability is affected by external temperature. So we've got some evidence, especially in rheumatology, to show that external temp temperature can have an effect on your pain as well. So cell permeability is increased massively. So while we're explaining to patients, you know, if you want to keep it complex, I'm going to give you a bit of a random example here, um, a political example. It's like every prosperous country needs to have a good trade agreement with other countries around. You can't just be an island on your own. So post-Brexit, if you want to, have a prosperous Britain, we need to have good, you know, trade link with the US, Australia, New Zealand. And that's what we're trying to do is open up the channels and have better cross, you know, uh, trades, you know, uh, we're selling stuff, we're bringing stuff. And that's basically cell permeability. We are just opening up the floodgates. So the cell membrane becomes more pliable, uh, the chemicals can move uh, faster, and that is uh, influenced by your magnetic field, you know. So it accelerates your cellular activities, it fast tracks the healing, which has been blocked by the pain and the inflammation. So this is the key thing. So when we're explaining how EMTT works, the two mechanisms I'm going to really make it clear to the patient is it's a strong anti-inflammatory. It reduces inflammation in the synovium. It reduces bone marrow edema. And second, it switches on, improves your cell permeability. There's a better flow between the cells. They can talk to each other better. And that fast tracks everything from your all functions. So that's how it seems to have effect at its basic cellular level, which is quite distinct mechanism on that. Okay, that's all well and good, but how, what sort of conditions? So patients, what sort of patients can we use in our clinic? So when we look into specific indications, there are quite a bit of indications here. So because it's such a wide area, you could use this for anyone who comes with a diffuse pain, for example, stage one frozen shoulder, you know, when they're getting like very night pain, they don't have a specific point or somebody with an acute onset of uh, chronic low back pain, any degenerative condition, hip OA, knee OA, ankle OA, where it's the whole joint is inflamed. We're not talking about one spot. Where shockwave is really good is when it's at one spot. When you're having a diffuse pain, more generalized pain, then uh, this is where I think it's relevant. So uh, widespread pain, uh, chronic degenerative diseases, all types of osteoarthritis, shoulder, hip, spine, knee, ankle, we generally, we advise not to use shockwave in rheumatic patients, especially in the flare-up. And that is opposite here. Works really well with patients with inflammatory conditions. So people with rheumatic arthritis, psoriasis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, those patients historically, we couldn't really treat with the shockwave because uh, you know, it causes more inflammation. So if you want to, uh, if, if you got a RA patient with bilateral hand pain, wrist pain, they're struggling, the hands are swollen, then there might be a good uh, room for that. Uh, spinal pain, facet joint, and I've already talked about frozen shoulder. Now, tendons. So generally, when we're dealing with chronic tendons, shockwave is a fantastic modality. But if you have an acute flare-up, so a runner comes in, he went for a speed session, and he's got flare-up within two weeks, then I think when you have an acute onset, then uh, EMTT is really good. Bone stress injury. So things like medial cable stress syndrome, osteitis pubis, very painful conditions. Um, you know, you see that in the runners and athletic population. Another great advantage of EMTT is it can be used people following hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement. So we generally don't advise shockwave immediately post-op. So after six weeks, after you have a hip replacement, so if you've got a patient like 62-year-old female or a male had a knee replacement, they come to you after eight weeks, they're struggling, they can't really progress the rehab. It's swollen, the pain is quite high, they're getting night pain they can't start the exercises. So that's where it's really useful. In a lot of places like in Germany, they use it uh, commonly after a hip or knee replacement. So it's not a contraindication, it's an indication. So having metal implants is not a problem at all with EMTT. Uh, we generally advise to wait for six weeks. So generally 
you know, it's pretty much the same as we give for an MRI guidelines as well. So many of you on, in the audience might be already having a shockwave. Uh, and it's quite reasonable to think, oh, I'm already getting fantastic results with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, shockwave. Why should I need an EMTT device here? Uh, I think the key thing here is, is sort of understanding the mechanism and the difference because they, although there are similarities, they're quite distinctly different. So let's go just once. This is not a shockwave talk, but generally when we talk about shockwave, we, you know, both radial and focus, the, who is the ideal patient for shockwave? The ideal patient for shockwave is somebody whose symptoms are chronic. We generally say at least three months. Whose symptoms are stable. We generally don't like to give shockwave to pain. Patients who come to a clinic with pain nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, or they're having severe night pain. So generally they're quite stable, you know, and they're generally able to do good rehab. We generally don't advise shockwave for very acute pain in a flare up on immediately following any type of surgery. So generally there's a big gap in the market here of shockwave. So these sort of patients with acute pain, acute flare ups, swelling, I don't think it's a very clever idea to put in high energy shockwave straight into that inflamed area. So this is where we need a bit more a safer and a less aggressive option for pain relief. So unless we reduce the pain, the patient won't be engaging in the rehabilitation. So, so when we talk about, uh, so let me give an example of a patient here. So you've got a 52 year old female, type two diabetes, high BMI, usually go together. And we know that there's a strong link between diabetes and frozen shoulder. She's suffering a lot. She's not able to you know, get back to work. Uh, she's been given naproxen. So this patient before COVID, if, somebody like, if I see somebody like this in the first two, three weeks, what works really like magic is a steroid injection. We know steroid works really well with the frozen shoulder, but there's a problem with steroid. Steroid doesn't just, if you put a steroid, if you put a steroid injection in your right knee, you can see traces of the steroid in the opposite knee within 10 minutes. It doesn't just stay in, in your knee or your shoulder, it goes to the whole body. So when you're putting a steroid in, you're going to have an adverse effect. So, so uh, I work in the NHS. So right now, the, uh, you know, when, when I give an injection to a patient with a steroid, the advice is they should self-isolate for seven days. So if you're giving a steroid injection in this climate, the patient must self-isolate. That's the guidelines. And that's a lot of hassle. And this sort of patient, 52-year-old female, high BMI, she's very, very high risk of getting COVID with a, with a steroid injection. And we can't zap in a, you know, a shockwave. You know, shockwave works really well for frozen shoulder, but in stage two and stage three, not in stage one. So in stage one, you're pretty much stuck here. All you can do is a little bit of painkillers. Nobody's going to give a steroid injection. Uh, you know, it's too risky, especially this sort of patients who are high risk. So I think the only sort of safe option, non-invasive option you got is something like EMTT, uh, which is sort of pretty much non-invasive uh, and also primarily designed for pain. So I think going to the point here is, what's the difference here between shockwave and here? So I think this is sort of, I try to keep it very simple here. So EMTT, for acute pain, irritable, high pain levels, neuropathic pain syndromes, widespread pain, diffuse pain presentation, degenerative conditions. Shockwave, I'm not going to throw my shockwave machine because I've got an EMTT. That's a different indication here. So, um, you know, chronic stable pain, chronic tendons. So the evidence for shockwave is mainly in tendons and muscles. Uh, whereas here with the EMTT, we're talking mainly for joints and inflammatory conditions. So, one is anti-inflammatory and one is pro-inflammatory. So I don't think there's any, there's a slight overlap, but they're distinct devices. So it's going to open up an entirely different market of patients. So we're getting a lot of interest from pain clinics and pain consultants, uh, you know, who uh, many patients don't want a spinal block. They don't want an epidural. So, you know, they don't want any, uh, they don't want a steroid injection. So those sort of cases, you're going to have a really excellent outcome with, um, with EMTT as well. Now, it's, it's entirely normal to be skeptical when, with the, when you come with a new device. And, um, uh, you know, people who attend my courses will know that I'm a big, you know, believer in evidence-based practice. You know, the first thing I'm going to ask anybody who comes with a new gadget is show me the evidence. Uh, because a lot of things which looks good on paper might not really, you know, translate to humans and in real, real world. So fortunately, we got about five to six RCTs. And we know that RCTs is the level one evidence, you know, highest... The highest form of evidence is a prospectivity RCT, a randomized control trial. And uh, this is the paper I gave you as a pre-reading. So we got a uh, RCT here, uh, which looked at 88, not uh, very hard to get more than 50 in an RCT, so decent numbers. And again, we can see 
that uh, and chronic low back pain is such a hard condition to treat you know is is one area which nothing works and here even here we are seeing some good effects on that another device uh, uh, you know which has come here another very painful condition which we see in two types of people we see in footballers runners but we also see in women after delivery is uh, pubic pain um, you know, uh, chronic osteitis pubis. So this study, small numbers, about 18 people have shown very good effect in people with chronic osteitis pubis as well. So really good, um, encouraging results. So this is, one is an RCT, one is a case series. You, you have nothing like this for the PM, PEMF. So here we're talking about a device which has already got evidence base, obviously not as good as, as large as Shockwave, but you know, everything has to start somewhere. But we got a good evidence to show that it's safe and it's very useful in diffuse pain presentations. The last bit of my talk, I'm just going to go a little bit on the technical side, not much because always going to go into the demonstration. So just to know what to explain to patients. So pretty simply, this is just what the machine actually from a physics point of view, you got a high voltage power supply, you got a switch, you got a coil, you know, and the coil produces electromagnetic uh, waves and influx and that's around 80 millitesla, which is less than one by 10. So that's pretty much it. You know, you got electricity, you got a capacitor, and the machine turns electricity into electromagnetic, and you got a magnet, obviously, which turns that into electromagnetic waves as well. That's pretty much a very simple version of that. Um, and it's quite aesthetically designed. So it's very flexible. You don't have to touch the patient. It's, it's got this applicator setting. You can put on the area where you want. Um, and the patient, you can sort of, uh, you know, work around that. So few words on the, on the dosage. Um, obviously, it's still work in progress. So the first thing here is um, the frequency. So when you talk about frequency, it can be anywhere from three to eight. The magnetic field, I've told you, is about 80 millitesla. The pulse duration, just like we give in shockwave, it's anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000. And the total time, which is, again, a plus point, is just 10 to 15 minutes, very quick. If you increase the frequency, it's less than 10 minutes. The recommendation is, is around like four to eight. So generally, if you're dealing with a chronic like osteoarthritis, we advise going more than eight. Maybe in a young athletic population, it might be four. So the minimum dosage is four uh, and the full therapeutic dosage is eight. And you can give even twice a week. So you could do like Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, the first two weeks. And then the other dosage you can give once a week. So the whole dosage can be done within four or five weeks. And the, the beauty of EMTT is it, because it's such a short treatment uh, and hardly any pain, you can combine that with your other hands-on treatment, exercises, or uh, my facial treatment with other shockwave or something like that. So you can easily merge with that. Now, with any medical equipment, we need to be very clear on contraindications. What are the things you need to be, what are the, what are the recommendations from the manufacturer? Pretty much, it's very simple. It's exactly the same as an MRI. So if you want an MRI, this is the... Uh, contraindication. If you have a pacemaker, if you've got an external defibrillator, if you've got an aortic valve replacement, if you've got any brain clips, if you've got co cochlear implants, if you've got any you know, metal fragments in your eyes, if you've got infusion catheters, if you've got sharpener injury, uh, generally it's, uh, it's common sense you know, not to be giving it on a pregnant, on an active cancer or directly on the brain, um, you know, just for legal purposes. But this is pretty much, if you, if you can have an MRI, you can have uh, EMTT. So pretty much very easy to remember, you know, exactly the same contraindications as you would do for uh, an MRI as well. Um, so another common question which we get asked is about joint replacements. So a patient had a total hip, a total knee, a total shoulder, especially with the knees and shoulder, they can get very sore. So generally, if you have one of the replacement, most consultants will advise to wait for at least six weeks before you start, um, you know, sort of giving a MRI. So the same recommendation here. So if you had a fresh, like a total replacement, I would wait for at least six weeks. And then um, uh, you could give a shock, you could give EMT to treatment. And uh, if you have other implants in your body, for example, a pedicle screw, a cage, especially with spinal surgery, metal screw in ACL, doesn't matter. Even uh, as long as it's not, you know, within one or two weeks, any metal implants, orthopedic implants, you can have uh, EMTT. If you can have an MRI, you can have EMTT. So it's pretty simple. And in fact, you can look at studies like this, uh, which have shown that uh, having a, you know, electrical muscles, you know, EMTT is a really good idea after joint replacement to reduce the inflammation around that, which is the main source of pain. So I think uh, definitely there's a huge range of benefits which you can see. 
the safety profile you know we know that mri be, mri has been around for a good 40 50 years no issues it's not like x-ray or a ct scan no issues with cancer or anything like that so it's pretty much entirely painless it's well tolerated um and it's a very very short learning curve it's not something as complex like a, like a shock wave or anything it's very simple very simple device uh you know you could sort of train the entire staff within a one or two hour session so very uh you know easy modality to learn uh it's non invasive there's no need to undress uh, pretty much pain free uh, uh some people might notice slight like a deep ache but it's well tolerated it's a quick treatment and because it's so short you can combine that with other treatment which you're already doing so if somebody comes with acute pain it makes sense to reduce the pain with emtt and then you could do your normal rehab and other exercises so obviously there are few limitation especially with the new technology the trials we don't have as much trials as shockwave but it's looking very promising we really don't know what's the long term outcomes we don't have uh, most studies look at only 3 months we really don't know what whether it changes it in the long term like 6 months to a year so like with anything else we need future research but with the current evidence we have we can say with confidence is it's safe it's effective it opens up a new avenue of uh, uh, of msk medicine which we historically didn't have um so i like to conclude with this slide uh you know before that uh, this sort of for me i think the summary key one here is it's a novel technology we have to accept that but electrical um, uh, em you know electrical uh, impulses has been around for a long time so the key take home message here is you know quick treatment um, very useful in acute any flare up position mainly for degenerative condition osteoarthritis neuropathic pain spinal stenosis uh, sciatica uh, stage 1 frozen shoulder all these cases where historically you wouldn't really want to give uh, shockwave as a first line of treatment and the mechanism is very different from shockwave uh, it's got a very strong anti inflammatory mechanism and the most important is it improves the cell malleability and just opens up the flood gate where the body can do its own magic by improving your cell recovery and uh, stimulate faster healing so both to healing but it's a very different way of doing things here so they sort of complement each other in a different spectrum so you might decide to start with emtt and later you might progress to uh, shockwave uh, depending on your um, uh, clinical reasoning so and with everything anything which was big started small so we have to be patient so you know we're not going to get 20 year trials in the next year or so it's going to take time uh, but you know we we already more than 25 you know clinics in germany doing that and we got around 6 7 clinics and you know we're getting more and i'll be starting with that in monday you know in central london and we got other 6 7 centers got helen edinburgh ov leeds you know southampton eves um you know all the, all the tutors have access to it and we're getting really encouraging results uh, from all the clinicians and uh, and also in other countries like in denmark so it's a really exciting time uh, for us uh, because it's not every other day that we come with something which is random totally different because uh, when you talk about shockwave you know whether it's ed or neural it's same technology but this is an entirely new technology which i think in my opinion we just just uh, scratching the surface uh and based on the numbers it could open up a big uh totally new area in msk medicine and especially uh you know in acute and chronic stages there's a lot of concern about dependency in opioids and other drugs um so this could be something which could really help us to wean people from more harmful drugs and uh, you know prevent the dependency so it's sort of a very exciting times there um so hopefully that's sort of gives you a bit of a flavor of the possibilities and the indications and gives a bit of clarity on how it's different the dosage you know uh, about 4 to 8 sessions quick treatment uh, mainly for acute painful conditions and things like that so we're going to move on to some practical um, side from you know ob where is going to look into the machine uh, and as clinicians we want to see cases and uh, we'll be sharing some cases which we have been treating for the last 4 5 months so thank you hugh thank you very much indeed uh, benoit that was an extremely good overview um as usual and so um we now pass over to earth who's going to uh earth in the garden who's going to give us um more practical um overview of it <laughs> have a nice drink benoit <laughs> yeah thanks for that benoit that's a great overview um certainly of, of what we've learned so far and and uh, let me introduce to you the big star of the show this is the EMTT the magnetolith um you know first of all it's a beautifully designed piece of kit and it really matches my other 
uh, shockwave equipment, which I really, really like. Um, it's so simplistic in its design. You have the main box with the transmitter who basically does all the high tech, high voltage stuff. You have the, the coil, which has its own cooling system uh, running through here, which is why this is um, even better. You can leave it on a patient and it doesn't get hot. Um, this can be then used uh, quite dynamically um, across larger areas, or you can then hold it over one area. It's great for um, being able to use over one main area if you want to use the little arm. It slots really nicely into that arm. It has one twiddle knob that you can then position it any way you like and leave it there. Um, and then you just undo it and the arm becomes very flexible as soon as you fasten it back up again and it holds tight in any direction. So that's, that's pretty easy and, and to, to uh, help with your patient positioning. Um, most important thing is just to get your patient as comfortable as possible and so that it can stay still while they're having the treatment. So I tend to use it very statically for um, very uh, specific areas like a knee OA. Um, if I'm having a back pain that's more diffuse, then I do just release it, it's really quick. And then I would move it over the larger area. So I'm going across the lateral hip as well as the low back. Um, and I would use it like that. In terms of the usability of it, it couldn't be much simpler. There's an on button at the back, which then takes the machine about 20 seconds to turn on. Um, the first thing that happens when you turn the machine on is that there's a high voltage sign that comes up here. It comes on once a day and you have to do a high voltage test. And that's the system self testing itself to make sure that everything is working. So obviously that's been used several times today. So that we don't have to do that today. Um, on the machine itself, there's, let me bring this a bit closer. There's a, only a few little dials and this is where it's so great. There's not much you can do with it. You have the top line, which is level zero, three to eight. Now the levels uh, are corresponding to how many millitesla you're putting in. So level eight is 80 millitesla and that's 80 millitesla here at the coil. As Benoit mentioned, the field is both wider and deeper um, than that. And so we know that at 18 centimeters, it still holds 10 millitesla. So if you read the papers on what kind of mag uh, magnetic field strength we need to create a a change in the in human tissue, uh, the threshold is 10 millitesla. Um, and um, even then, if we go down at the coil, it's now 70, 60, 50, 40, 30. Now, to be honest, most of the time you will start on level eight, okay? Um, level eight um, gives 80 millitesla. Most people don't have any sensation um, at all. Over certain areas that we've found, the low back, the hips sometimes, and the shoulders, it can be a little bit sensitive and they get this deep ache uh, as, it, as the pulses go through. And then we might need to just adjust it a little bit according to pain levels. We don't want them to be in pain and if they get such a strong response, um, then we need to turn it down. The second one down is the Hertz. So um, from what we've seen in the research at the moment, a lot of the research has been done on four Hertz. Um, so four hertz per second, it would mean that the treatment takes around about 15 minutes for a, a, a dose of 4,000 pulses. Um, whether there's a difference between four and eight hertz, there's nobody at the moment that can tell us. Um, and for the sake of time within the session, because we like to do both rehab and also uh, in certain cases, shockwave too, um, we tend to stick with the eight hertz. Um, but it's certainly something that we need to look into and develop further. Uh, the third line down is quite simply how many pulses you're going to put in, into your treatment area. Um, and the general rule of thumb that we go by is that if you're treating an area just with EMTT, you probably need to be closer to 4,000 um, pulses. Now, we've tried to, um, to alter that. And, and there's certain things that happen, like 2,000 pulses, if you were treating a low back, you tend to get some partial relief of the pain from what I've seen. Um, but by the time you get to like three and a half, four thousand, uh, the patient gets a really good pain relief and you feel that the soft tissues just relax a lot more in there. Um, in terms of then, when would you use a smaller dose? 
Um, if you had done a shockwave treatment beforehand and you want to have the general, uh, general uh, stimulation on the area as well, you might choose to go with 2,000. So in combination, you use about 2,000. And if it's a standalone treatment, we go for 4,000 at the moment, um, purely because that's what the, our um, German researchers and experts tell us as well. Um, and it also seems to work really well in, in clinical practice. The last one down is um, just the counter, okay? So um, you have a counter then which the, the count up to the, your dosage number, so you can easily tell, and it's quite therapeutic to sit and watch the numbers go up and down. Um, and then, first of all, there's no complicated way of turning this on. You've got a button at the bottom. So once you've set your hertz, your level, your the dosage, you literally just press the button, and the machine goes. It's really quiet. Can sit really next to it. There's no problems. Don't put your credit cards next to it. Don't put your phones next to it. Um, I have had my credit card completely wiped um, by standing next to it, um, so I wouldn't advise that. So you can then zero it, and off you go again. So that's as simple as the EMTT is. Um, it does have a cooling system, and occasionally you will be asked, just like if you have the if you have the focus shockwave. Um, it has a cooling system that needs to, the water needs to be refueled. Uh, and it will tell you down here. And if you know the focus, it takes a little while, maybe five, 10 minutes to refill the water. Um, on this one, it's even quicker. It takes about half the time. So two, three minutes um, worth of, um, of treatment there. Um, Benoit, I can't share my screen. Could you um, organize so that I can share my screen? Please? Yeah, yeah. I'll make you the host here. Yeah? Thank I'll you. Make it, so, yeah. Uh, make Can you do that now? Yeah, I can do that now. Yeah, th thanks. That's good. Uh, if it's the way it's all live. Yeah, yeah I'm just trying to, I've got the Zoom. Um, on the screen, yeah. It's on top of my screen, so I can't get to the button where I play it. Um, hang on. You're nearly there next to the... Let me see, I can move it down, there we go. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, full screen. So, <laughs> fun. So the EMTT, we're gonna go through a few of the kind of success stories that we've had. There's been many. Um, I think it's important to um, just uh, talk a little bit about the variety of cases that we have and, and what we've been doing. And, and so this is just a quick overview view again, if you, if you didn't catch what I was saying earlier. Um, the four different things that the screen tells you, and it's the only thing that you need to worry about, um, apart from the on button at the top, at the bottom, sorry. Um, so this is our initial clinical um, kind of results and, and uh, thoughts. Uh, currently, it, well, it's now 600,000 pulses, and it equates to somewhere between, probably nearly 200 individual treatments. Um, and like I said, we've had some amazing results that are quite astounding. Um, but we also realized that this is an emerging therapy and we have lots to learn in terms of dosage. Um, you know, whether there's certain different doses just for different joints, uh, smaller joints, larger joints, and things like that. And um, we are currently just collecting as much data as we can, I guess. Uh, the German um, researchers and experts are also doing the same and they're creating a database and we'll be sharing more of that as time goes by. And that's probably going to be the first scientific wave uh, that comes out, uh, the, the kind of ideas and experience sharing uh, amongst the people that have this technology. Um, and then later, like when I says, it takes a few years to get the papers published. Um, but so we'll, I'm quite happy from what I've seen so far to be um, an early adopter and seeing where we go from there. So the first case study um, was actually not mine. It was one of my colleagues here in the clinic and we just had such a great result with this man. Um, he came in to see me probably five months before we got the EMTT and he, he wanted, wondered if the shockwave would actually help. And he'd been diagnosed with severe hip OA and been told by his surgeon that he was due to have a hip replacement. However, he was desperate not to have uh, that done. Um, he wasn't using any... Um, um, analgesia himself during work, um, but he um, just kind of suffered it and used to have a lot of restriction of movement, 
pain stiffness on the morning and the pain would gradually get worse throughout the day uh, as he was working. He's um, a manual worker up on his feet a lot. Uh, and before treatment, uh, he had a very stiff hip. So flexion was 90 degrees, but it was kind of a solid 90. Uh, and the same with the internal and external rotation, they were very stiff and solid. They weren't really moving much at all. And he, he was unable to perform even basic exercises like a hip bridge um, on, on the first assessment. So the treatment then, uh, quite simple, started with 2,000 pulses on the front of the hip, um, level eight, eight hertz, and he, he could tolerate that with some minor discomfort. Um, then we started him on the lateral hip, 4,000 pulses there, so quite a big dose really, um, but this was probably the first um, client that we had uh, with the EMTT, or one of the first ones, and we kind of thought, well, more would be better, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. Uh, we gave him a bridge, he could do the bridge, and we also gave him a clam exercise um, initially, uh, and this was at, at the first session. And he had four weekly treatments. Um, we advised him, according to the research that we've seen, that he should be having twice a week, but he wanted to uh, just see how once a week uh, went down. And um, we booked him in for 15-minute uh, slots and treated him in about 10 minutes and just follow up on his exercises and progress them as we needed to. Um, so, um, in week two, um, his hip flexion has already gone to 120 degrees. His internal rotation had increased and he's managed to then progress to single leg bridge. He was already feeling a lot of pain relief, um, but he's, he was quite astounded. He could now bend down and, and put his socks on in the morning much easier um, and things like that. By week four, when he finished, he had a 60% reduction in pain and he'd maintained this improvement in range of movement and he was able to perform strengthening exercises uh, a couple of times a day um, and, you know, was doing really, really well. He was coping better at work and he was really, really happy. And he has planned to come back if the pain returns because he gave him so much relief and it stops him from having to worry about his uh, uh, eventual hip surgery, I guess. Um, and this is what really astounds me with this machine, how good it is for those conditions. Like Benoit said about the arthritis in terms of the synovitis that you have and also the bone edema. Um, it seems to have a major effect on these things, uh, which is, is kind of why you can explain these, these radical changes um, in a very short period of time in these very tricky to treat patients. Um, I remember when we got first introduced to the technology uh, over in Switzerland and they explained to us what an effect it could have on um, these arthritic conditions, the degenerative spines, the hips and the knees. Um, and I just thought, well, this could actually be a game changer, changer if it's as good as they promise. And it certainly seems to be. The next one um, is also a great win for us. 57-year-old um, golfer, uh, really keen, but his biggest issue was he had, he had knee pain for about two years. Um, and it was in both knees, right was slightly worse than the left. And he used to take painkillers before he even went out to play. But even with that, the painkillers, afterwards he was aching badly, stiffened up in his knees uh, in the evenings, and he was struggling to sleep uh, during the night after his golf game. So it was, it was troubling him um, and causing him a lot, lot of problems. Um, when we first had a look at him, he was unable to extend his, his knees. They were kind of uh, just not locking out. Um, his flexion was 90, uh, 100 degrees, but he didn't have much rotation in there. Um, his medial joint line was really, really tender, um, very ouchy, like leaping off the table. And um, when we did the diagnostic ultrasound, he did show some thickening uh, in a couple of places. And um, I think there was some, some uh, Doppler signal as well, but I didn't save the scan, so I couldn't share it with you, unfortunately. Um, the treatment was a combined treatment, um, as I mentioned, and combined with radial and focused. Um, the radial was used on the lower third of the quad, um, which was really hard and stiff, and we needed you know, to loosen that off to release some of the tension on the, the patella, I guess. Um, we then did a focused uh, treatment, about 2,000 pulses on the medial joint line, finding the most tender spots along there and um, doing at least 500 pulses on each, but 2,000 in total. And then we followed that up with 2,000 pulses with the ENTT uh, level eight with eight hertz. Um, we started them off with a quarter squat, um, that's all he could tolerate at the time. But as time went by, that squat got deeper and deeper till uh, he was going to below parallel. Um, we did bridge, um, we did a single-legged bridge and 
we also did hip, up, hip abduction, so sideline leg lifts um, for reps. So initially he could do three or four, and then he was fatiguing, uh, but towards the end he was doing about 20. And this, this has all happened in a five-week course of treatment. Um, so the progress was pretty, pretty cool. Um, after three weeks, he came back in and he was uh, very happy. He had had no pain during or after golf, and he wasn't taking any painkillers, but there was still some morning stiffness the day after, uh, but nothing that he couldn't tolerate, and he was really chuffed for the results. Um, after five weeks, so a total of six treatments over five weeks, he had no pain um, during golf, after golf, or in the mornings, and he'd increased his amount of walking in his spare time, and he was also playing golf three times a week. So for him, that was a huge win, and, and quite astounding, really. Uh, bilateral, I would say, uh, mild to moderate OA, um, and and uh, a very very happy patient overall. And then completely on the other side of the scale, and and this is not an isolated case. I've had um, three fat pad irritations, so infrapatella fat pads um, come to the clinic, and a couple of young kids. And this one was um, a fourteen year old academy rugby league player. He'd had pain in his uh, kneecaps for about a year. Been to see a previous physio as well um, at the club, not helped much. The pain had just inflamed every time he tried to do any form of um, running activity and he was stopping him from training and he was getting concerned as he had uh, trials to stay within the academy uh, in about, uh, well, about a month away now, it was two months uh, when he came to see me. Um, so he, he'd, over the time, his dad, who was his rugby coach as well, um, explained that he had lost his speed on the pitch he used to be quite um, fast and have good acceleration. And now he ran quite a slow pace. And he told me himself that he was unable to run without any pain. Um, so again, we found a thick and irritated fat pad. You know, they, they're quite uh, easy to identify on palpation, um, quite thickened just by the kneecaps, both medially and laterally. Um, Pain on hyperextension. Um, he, you know, this is a, a common trait with uh, the fat pad syndromes. He was weak throughout his whole kinetic chain, probably because he's had pain in that leg for over a year. Um, he couldn't stabilize his pelvis uh, on single leg stands, and he also had poor hamstring strength um, through there. So weak calves, quads, uh, glutes, but also hamstrings um, and lateral pelvic stabilizers as well. So we had a bit. We knew we had a bit of work to do, um, and especially. Uh, because of the inflated fat pads, which tend to be really, really irritable. So the treatment, again, we decided to, the treatment was going to consist of two things initially. Uh, first of all, EMTT, uh, 4,000 pulses um, on eight, level eight, eight hertz. And the second thing we did was we actually used some kinesia tape. So I don't know how you feel about kinesia tape, uh, but it's, for me, it's really nice and flexible. And what we do is we just uh, create the U-shaped smiley face um, compressing the fat pad in, um, which tends to help the irritation a little bit. And so we did a combination of that and sent him away. Um, initially, we started him off on um, a bridge and we started him off on a calf raise. And that's the only exercise he had because he couldn't tolerate anything else. Uh, but that soon changed. So he came in week two, noticed that he hadn't had any pain on daily activities, uh, which was a first, um, but he hadn't tried running it because I told him not to. And, and we managed to then progress him onto a single legged bridge. We uh, managed to move uh, from gastro, um, from a bilateral to a single legged stance. Um, and then further down the line uh, on the next treatment, we managed to do uh, lunges, Bulgarian squats, so rear foot elevated squats, continued with the gastro ciliaries strengthening. We continued with uh, high reps on the uh, single legged bridge. Um, we also added some monster walks in there. And after the fourth session, we have now introduced a uh, walk-run protocol and also some progressive sprints in there. Uh, and once he's cleared that, he will be going on to some change of directions. Um, and we've also started him on some jumps with landing control. All of this was completely pain-free um, on testing before the fourth session. Um, so we're quite happy for him to progress with that. Um, I'm reviewing him in another month, um, but so far so good. No pain on palpation. Uh, there doesn't seem, doesn't seem to be any thickening of the fat pad and he's reporting uh, just big smiles and happy to be active again after a whole year of not being able to run uh, properly. Then we go on to where the EMTT can be a little bit of magic and 
so this is this chap here, um, Richard, on uh, the screen here, uh, is a landscape gardener. And he stepped off a ladder about four days before he came into clinic. He, we were treating him for uh, a tennis elbow, um, but he'd uh, twisted on his knee and he had uh, palpation pain on the medial joint line. Um, he had uh, a, a low grade ache in there, but he, I, he was worried that it was something more serious. And on testing, there was some valgus testing at 30 degree flexion. And we also saw on ultrasound that uh, the deep fibers of the MCL was a bit disrupted. Um, so I kind of decided it was a grade one. It wasn't really a lot of laxity in there, um, not enough to call it a grade two. But we know that these things can take, you know, four to six weeks uh, to kind of settle down. And while I was treating his um, elbow, I then chose to use the EMTT as I know it can be an accelerant of the healing process. Quite simple, 2000 pulses, 80 mil Tesla or level eight, eight hertz. And we treated him uh, first um, during that one session. Um, after that, he came in and said, well, it was a significant reduction in pain, but it's still there, you know, very stoic guy, um, didn't really have much to say apart from that, it's still there, you know. Um, after week two, he came in and said, I've not had a pain, twinge of pain since the last session. Um, and he literally just switched off after the second treatment. So um, then I saw him, uh, I've seen him again and still nothing there. Um, in no pain during work, um, is active, is lifting, uh, twisting on his leg, no pain on valgus testing or uh, any medial joint line palpation. Um, and this was quite a cool thing to do. You know, he's now um, spreading the word to a lot of my clients uh, about, uh, or rather his clients about my treatment. And I'm now seeing some of his clients come in to see me for various issues, um, which, which then the EMTT has also helped. So, um, you know, the, the, certainly the word of mouth is spreading rapidly uh, among my patient group uh, about the great results that we're having. And this is another piece of magic. Um, I keep calling it a magic because it's the magic machine in our clinic. Um, and this was a case of an intercostal nerve. So this was a young girl, she's about 25 years old and she'd been into the gym um, a few days before the pain started. So a heavy weight session um, with, uh, uh, for the chest session and she'd felt something pull uh, after the session and uh, it just got worse and worse. And, she woke up and she was in acute pain, chest pain, traveling around the side of the rib. And there was pain every time she breath and then took a breath in. And uh, on examination there, we had a lot of muscle spasm in the area, um, a lot of pain on the palpation of the rib angles, which also reduced some of the pain. Uh, there was pain on the rotation to the same side. So we knew that the rib joint there was compressing um, and her pain was a, a good nine out of 10. She was in a lot of pain. And so we stuck the EMTT on just to try to calm that neural inflammation. Chose 3,000 pulses uh, randomly. I could have chosen four. Um, I thought I'll see what 3,000 does first of all. Um, and after <clears throat> the 3,000 pulses, the, she had an immediate relief of pain. Uh, her anxiety lowered. She could actually take a big breath in, um, and she only had some minor tightness. She came. She was currently seeing me for um, an Achilles problem, and. She came in the week later and reported that she'd not had any further discomfort in uh, that pain um, after the first treatment. So a quick win for us and a really, really happy client. Now this is um, a fun one. This is um, Shawnee. She's given me permission, by the way, to share these videos with you. Um, she injured her wrist and I'm gonna show you the video in a minute because she is an avid um, Instagrammer and she filmed this as part of her um, workout at home. She's a CrossFitter and um, I got to see this injury. Um, well, I got the phone call um, about half an hour after it happened and then I saw her in the clinic um, immediately after. So what are you gonna see here now? Okay, so that's quite graphic. And what happens here is that she is holding that up in a Turkish getup and she feels something strain in her left hand and she decides to drop the weight the weight lands on her left wrist. Oh, hang on. Let me get that again. And hyperextends the wrist. She feels a pop um, and immediate pain. Um, so very, very distressful for her. Um, and a quick phone call to the physio. And I said, don't panic. Um, let's get you to A&E. Let's get an x-ray on that. And come and see me tomorrow. Because I was seeing her boyfriend uh, for uh, and something else, <laughs> I guess. And... Um, I had a quick look at it and it was acutely swollen. Um, it was restricted in movement 
there was no tenderness on the um, uh, on the radius or the uh, the ulna. Uh, there was some tenderness in the proximal row of the um, the carpal bones, but the, uh, again, it was very difficult to uh, tell if there was anything further. So she had a tendered A and E. Uh, she had an X-ray, and they said it was inconclusive. She then um, got a phone call a couple of days later saying that they thought it was a scaphoid fracture and that they wanted to MRI scan it. So they, she was booked in for an MRI scan a couple of weeks later. Uh, meanwhile, uh, day one of the injury, we managed to do the EMTT. She was coming along with her boyfriend. So uh, while I was treating him, um, she got a dose of EMTT. Um, and then we continued to treat her. We treated her for the first two weeks, twice a week. Uh, we then um, did 40,000 pulses and we did some very re uh, re gentle rehab. So um, uh, supination, pronation, extension and flexion within, within comfort. And then some isometrics uh, within that available range as well to try to kind of um, stimulate the muscles um, and see if we can just focus on keeping it pain-free while it's healing. Um, and no other uh, advice really apart from that. Now, Shawnee is a bit of a exercise uh, machine. And so she did then, uh, you can check her out on, on Instagram if you can find her, but she did some really innovative things with some uh, rubber bands and things. And she continued to deadlift and um, pull-ups, single-armedly and things like that with, with just help of bands to maintain her strength. Uh, she even found a way of continuing to stimulate her biceps um, without using the wrist. And um, also trying, uh, against my best, better advice, to try to rest that wrist a little bit. But she had a wrist brace um, and she cracked on. And you know what, every week I kept seeing improvements and I just asked her to be steady. Um, so after the first two weeks, we then added some class four laser in there. We then started uh, we, we also got confirmed that there was no fracture in there, but there was lots of bone edema. Um, and uh, yeah, so we then continued to then get a little bit more aggressive with the rehab. Uh, but this is after the third session, we did the third session, and then we started with positional isometrics through the range uh, and also allowed it to train a little bit within pain. Um, and we also did some, some glides to the wrist joints to try to just to keep it moving and keep it mobile and see where that and, and it lent us to. So um, this is a video then that she did after session two. Okay, so this is her uh, going gentle on it. <laughs> it's uh, absolutely crazy. Uh, and I think the pain, uh, the, the face tells it tells a story. But after the third session, this is what she sent me. She goes, oh my God, look at me. Um, she's now doing pull-ups with full grip, no pain. Um, and then she was doing this. Now she granted she has a wrist brace on the on the one on the left. On the right, she's just got a little wrist wrap um, on there. Um, again, huge differences. She came back in, and there was even less swelling um, after she'd upped her exercise um, to that level there. Um, and that's kind of a lot of the kind of success stories that we've had. We've had many, many more. Um, you know, degenerative spines. We have had osteoarthritic shoulder who are just doing amazing things at the moment. Um, and all thanks to the EMTT. Um, I can't praise it well enough. I'm so excited to be able to uh, not only use it in clinic, but also share this with you. And um, I hope that if you, uh, if you have any questions, then you please you know, send them our way. Um, there's been lots of other cases as well that we've, uh, we've looked at. And I think Eve is also going to share some of his um, stories. Um, and then I'm going to see if we can get off this screen. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Uh, if, um, so uh, I would encourage everybody, please, to uh, drop some questions into the chat box. After Eve's finished, we'll be, um, Eve's is finished, we'll be taking questions and answers, or we'll, we'll refer to the uh, chat box anyway. So please, uh, please pop some in there and we can deal with them then. So now, um, Eve's the boss. Uh, are you there, Eve's? Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm here. Good, there we go. So, yeah, thanks, you. Um, so, um, I've sort of joined at uh, the, the last minute uh, today just to, you know, uh, share some of my experiences. There's a couple of, um, you know, uh, case studies which are quite similar to um, OOF uh, with regards to hip, OA, etc. Um, I had, uh, or I wanted to really try and isolate the EMTT as a standalone treatment. Now it's not obviously what we would do in standard practice of physiotherapy, but because this, this is new and 
for me to be able to confidently um, you know, promote this particular piece of equipment, uh, I wanted to kind of test it a little bit myself. So, um, so I've, I've got a few case studies in, in, in which I've just literally used the uh, EMTT machine and, and, and no other treatments, uh, just so I could confidently say that the, the changes uh, you know, occurred as a result of using the EMTT machine. So um, in that respect, uh, I had a 55-year-old uh, lady who had been having a, a two-month history of worsening shoulder pain, uh, you know, waking her four or five times of the night, uh, losing range of motion. Uh, you know, on assessment, she had um, you know, about 120 degrees of flexion, 100 degrees of abduction, lost more or less all her external rotation and uh, functional internal rotation. Are you trying to share your screen at the moment? No, uh, I don't. No. Okay, fair enough. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I did uh, diagnose her with a sort of phase one uh, frozen shoulder and my normal practice would be to uh, inject her. Now, as she's got stage five polycystic liver and kidney disease, uh, is on a transplant list. And at the same time, uh, with the whole COVID-19 situation, we were obviously all informed, uh, you know, to not inject. Uh, she actually requested a course of acupuncture, um, which, you know, I did six sessions over a course of three weeks, uh, and it really made no difference. Um, you know, the, uh, her pain score was ranging between six and nine out of 10, uh, really debilitating sort of pain, not being able to get away from it. Uh, as I say, the six sessions of acupuncture uh, did, did nothing at all. I then decided uh, to do uh, a course of EMTT and uh, we did that for four weeks. Uh, we did eight sessions over four weeks, uh, 4,000 impulses on each session. Uh, we used level eight uh, at a five hertz. After four weeks, her, um, you know, uh, pain scale had reduced uh, to uh, zero to three out of 10. So a significant reduction in uh, pain uh, as a result of the EMTT, which we were not able to achieve with uh, any other sort of form of treatment or an injection. Um, so that was, you know, a partic particularly good uh, evidence for me that, you know, in those kind of uh, situations where pain is the main uh, symptom, that, um, you know, it, it seems to be having a good effect. I also had one patient who's a 55 year old male who presented with a uh, post hepatic neuralgia. So he had shingles uh, about two months prior um, and had this ongoing thoracic neuralgic type of pain. Uh, again, I did a similar protocol uh, and his pain score reduced uh, from eight out of 10 to three out of 10. Um, so, Again, not necessarily a true musculoskeletal kind of complaint, but again, evidence that uh, we have an effect on pain. And then the last one I want to share is just you know, something that uh, we all see in clinic day in, day out, which was a, a six week history of a, an acute uh, sort of a low back pain complaint in a 50 year old. Uh, again, got high pain levels at sort of six to eight out of 10. Um, wasn't really responding to our normal care of sort of you know manual therapy exercises. He was on anti-inflammatories and uh, pain medication, but we just weren't progressing. So again, I just stopped everything, stopped him even doing exercises, and uh, did six sessions over you know three weeks, uh, and we reduced his pain uh, you know to a one or a two out of ten. And then we engaged in exercise after that, and, and you know, uh, that all settled down nicely. So I'm aware that you uh, guys have issues with um, the sound, so I'm going to leave it like that for now. I think we're going to wrap up.
uh, for questions anyway. So, um, yeah, I just think that uh, I've done about 120 treatments so far uh, with various you know, uh, successes, but um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with, with the results I've been getting, especially using it as a single modality. So I'm fairly I'm happy with my investment and, and I know that this has a place within what we do uh, and often, often can be a catalyst to then being able to do the rehab by reducing the, um, you know, the pain levels, allowing then for all of our other stuff to become integrated in what we do. Okay, cheers. Thanks very much, Eves. Um, so that wraps up the a third of our educators this evening. I'm sure you've all enjoyed it like I have. Very uh, clear and uh, fantastic all-round view of this exciting uh, device. So, then I would you like to come on again and just sort of wrap the session up? We don't have a lot of questions. I guess that's... Uh, yeah, so the couple of things I think will be a, a good addition. You know, we've got, you know, nice cases there, you know, from both, both of you. So, I think there are queries on if people wanted to um, check the device. So, we're based in Life Plus in Bond Street. So if any of us wants to have a look on the device, especially in London, you can always contact us and we can um, or, you know, check that out. So one of the things I want to discuss with Ovi was, um, you know, obviously you've treated quite a few cases. So it's the patient explanation is always important, isn't it? Like, when, you know, how to explain this to patients. So what's your normal spiel when you, when you sort of uh, explain the device to patients? Like, how do you sort of sell it or explain this on your first session? Well, um, to, to, to me, it comes, uh, comes down to a little bit of the diagnosis of the problem that you've got in front of you. So if you understand uh, not only what the machine does, but you also understand the underlying physiology of the, the, the condition that you're treating. So say you have your standard uh, degenerative condition where you have the synovitis, you do have um, the, in the, the local both um, uh, neuro, neuro, um, neuropathic inflammation as well as the bone edema and the, the kind of the pressure that's in there. Um, what I then do is I explain what the condition is and then I'll explain how this machine actually makes a difference. Um, people love that there's a, a new technology. Um, they just go, oh, I've read about that. Um, and so I've put out a newsletter to my clients. I've put uh, lots of information and written a blog on uh, my website as well. And uh, a lot of people have already read this before they come into the clinic. Oh, I've read about that. I've seen that on your newsletter. And so then when I explain to them that this new technology has the ability to reduce the swelling within the bone and it will reduce the inflammation in the lining of the bone. And, and then I draw out the evidence of um, that we've had this year of where the cartilage is proven to not give that much pain. Uh, so we know that even though there is a wear and tear condition, and this is perfect BPS, um, you know, we, we've got to think about the, the whole patient. And we know that the, da, da, the, the, the pain isn't equal to the damage, um, but there are associated problems with the conditions that we're treating. And if we can agree deal with those associated problems, which is the swelling, the, is the irritation and, and the, the inflammation that's going on in there, um, then we reduce the, 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 the symptoms. We can then start to strengthen the joint back up again. We make a stronger joint. I, I also spend a lot of time explaining how they go through a downward spiral when they first start with degeneration as well, where they start to do less activity, uh, et cetera, because of the pain and discomfort that they're having and stimulating the muscles less by shifting the weight away. So we're gonna try to stop that process by reducing the pain and reducing the inflammation, follow that up with building up the, the joint again. And yeah. so that they can manage this condition much, much better in the long term. Yeah, so it seems like based on the pathology. So obviously patients are in a rush to get better. So what, like with my shockwave patients, I say it takes three to four weeks or sometimes six weeks for the improvement. So what, what do you say to patients? When can they expect results when they start with the EMTT? <laughs> yeah, so clinically we see improvements immediately. So patient gets off, off the treatment bed and, and um, they feel different. Um, they feel like there's some pressure that's lifted and they already feel pain relief, which is amazing. Um, I tend to advise them that this is a short-term thing, um, that it's probably going to last for a couple of days, but the processes have now started in terms of um, trying to de uh, deal with the underlying pathology. Um, it's accumulative in nature, and that's why we then need to have repeated stimulation. Um, 
the severity of the problem then determines whether you should have it twice a week or whether you have it once a week. Um, and we know that by uh, what we've seen in the clinic that once a week works. We also know that twice a week, uh, twice a week works really well. Um, so having somebody come in um, twice a week for a severe uh, arthritic problem is going to help them much quicker. And so it's about educating both um, managing their expectations uh, and as well as um, giving yourself time to actually educate them more about their problem and also going through the necessary rehab to ensure that you get the long-term outcomes that you really want for that patient. Can we ask a question, please, about um, somebody's asked about what is a reasonable charge per session or a course? Um, well, I, I'm in the north of, of England um, and uh, I have a very socialistic view on, on charging. <laughs> and so I try to charge as little as possible. Um, but at the same time, I know I need to pay back the machine and also the ongoing service charge um, uh, that the machine incurs once we hit 10 million pulses. Um, so that's something that I've, I've, I've accounted for in my treatments. And if somebody has a physiotherapy session with me, um, the introductory offer that we have at the moment is that they pay a, an extra charge of, of £10 per treatment. Um, I will probably put that up at some point um, soon. With, well, I guess we're three months down now with, with the EMTT, and it's probably time to maybe change that to 15 um, because we are... Um, you know, by the time I've paid my physios and by the time I've paid my receptionist and the lights in the clinic plus the machine, um, there is not a lot left of that ten pounds. So uh, I'll probably put it up to about fifteen, but that, I, st I still think that's quite cheap for what this <laughs> machine does. Um, yeah, we should send all the patients to you. Some of the treatments I charge thirty pounds. Um, it takes me fifteen minutes to do thirty pounds, uh, and that will probably go up to forty-five once we get into the swing of things. How about Eves? In south of England, how is it? Uh, yeah, so I, I probably... Uh, You're not a, a socialist. Of, <laughs> I'm not a socialist. <laughs> I'll probably take a bit of a different view, uh, just looking at the investment side of it. And, you know, uh, but, um, you know, I, I've been playing around with it, basically, just to kind of see where, where to pitch it, uh, you know. And uh, because I've mainly been looking at it as a course of treatment, you know, I've, I've basically sold it more like a package, similar to my shockwave therapy, which, you know, I sell as packages as well. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of uh, around about the 200, 250 pound mark uh, for my course of treatment. Yeah. So, yeah. How many sessions do you have in that course? Sorry? How many sessions is included in your course? Eight. Eight. Yeah, I guess we have to, London, it's going to be more expensive. You have to look at that geographical location, isn't it? Uh, one last thing is, obviously, you know, it's a very safe device. We don't get any pain. Uh, so in some literature, there is some evidence showing, like, you might have a temporary flare-up for a day or two. So it might be useful to, what sort of things would you explain to patient to very rare, you know, not, you know, side effects, but more like a discomfort sort of thing. What would you say in that instances, just to warn patients? treatment that we would do I would always say to patients that you know what I went what I am expecting but that from time to time there can be you know a potential transient side effect from it you know and obviously you know to report it to us um, you know if, if they're particularly concerned about it so I think you know just like with any other modality of treatment that we would have you, you have to warn your patients of potential side effects and I think with the EMTT it's no different uh, and, you know, most people tolerate this very well, but from time to time you will have one patient who could potentially have an adverse effect. So I think it's really important that there is a, 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 a means that they can get back to you to be able to reassure them uh, of, of what's happened there. I would uh, can you just, uh, then I, can you just have a screen through the last three questions there, please? Yeah. Um, we've only got eight minutes left okay. of our yeah, point sure. of time. I think that uh, obviously for a hip and knee replacement, it's very safe to uh, use within six weeks. So, Ovi, have you used anyone post joint replacement? Uh, not necessarily acute, or yeah, no. I've I've had a, a client who came in three years after. Um, he was a, a bit of a dire state, to be fair. He had a, a hip replacement, which ended up in a massive hematoma, 
and had minimal rehab after the surgery, uh, discharged with uh, still a huge hematoma and his whole five kind of blew up. And since then have not, has done nothing and he's deteriorated and deteriorated. Um, couldn't sleep on his hip, struggled to stand and put weight through his uh, operated hip. Um, but he's had it uh, x-rayed and everything is a-okay with the, uh, with the, Implant, the yeah. placement. Yeah. Um, we then put um, 4,000 pulses through there. Um, level eight, eight hertz, tolerated it, no problems. Minor ache through, through the, uh, the local area when, while he was having it. And he felt immediate pain relief. Um, that relief got bigger after the second treatment. After the third treatment, he's barely got any pain. He can sleep on his painful hip at the moment. And he's currently doing really well in terms of getting back into his rehab. He can now put weight through that leg. He can get through a bridge okay. He struggles a little bit with the lateral hip muscle still, but he's, he's doing really, really well. And, you know, after three weeks in, um, he's doing so much more than he's done for the last three years. It's a really, really cool, cool case, really. Brilliant. So that's, and you would use the similar frequency for the hip or knee, you know, joint replacement, sort of eight, eight, four thousand sort of thing. Hmm? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, um, in terms of the, the hertz, we don't know enough about it. So in terms of the, the hertz, whether it's four hertz or eight hertz, um, as far as we know, it's only the, dif the, the differences in the time that it takes to deliver the energy. Um, very similar to what we know with the focus. The focus, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference in focus shockwave, whether it's uh, four or six or eight hertz. Um, whether, whether there's some difference in the depth of treatment that it achieves. Um, that'd be interesting to speak to the, phys uh, the, the physician, um, uh, the physicians, the, the chaps at Stoltz, <laughs> the experts there and see if they can come up with something that would be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I don't have any problems put, putting it over there. Um, I meant, like you mentioned on the safety side of things, the six week is kind of where the bone integration happens with the, uh, with the with the, the the implant, and that's an important point. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily do it that that early. I'll probably even wait a little bit longer. Um, and I see there's a question here whether it's safe to use. Yeah, as long as it's MRI safe, which is six weeks after the replacement, then you are safe to put the ENTT on as well. You know, like I spoke to one of my my best friend runs an MRI scanning unit, and I told him that this machine put and puts out uh, 80 millitesla, and he laughed. Uh, because an MRI scanner puts out 1.5 or 3 Tesla, uh, which is uh, an awful lot more energy than what we're using. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we're pretty safe. Okay, well, I think we better wrap it up there, um, everybody. Thanks very much to the um, Benoit for hosting and our other two educators. Uh, it's been fascinating. I think everybody will agree. And uh, we look very much uh, forward to you joining us again on another one of these uh, excellent uh, uh, webs. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night.